Hey Church, I want to encourage you today on a message that has been really the theme of my life. Um, I want to talk to you about being gifted and graced. Now we're all being given gifts. We're good at, you know, there's the gift of the gab. Maybe some of you are gifted at cooking. Now I appreciate those that are gifted at cooking. Or maybe we're gifted at organising things. We need each other. We need people to complement who we are. And I want you to realise that you've got to not downplay what God has given you. You see, we're meant to develop those gifts in our lives, not to bury them and just to leave it alone or downplay them. And I love this quote. It says this, that God does not call the qualified people, but he simply qualifies those he calls. He doesn't call the qualified, like those that have it together, but he calls and he and he qualifies those he calls. And I want you to know God calls and he qualifies broken people and we're all broken. I want to encourage you today to realize that you have potential and we need to grow in that potential. It says in uh, Luke 2, 52, that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature. Uh, he grew in favor with God and with all people. He grew. And you've got to realize that it takes time and process. It's a journey. And God's grace, as it says in 2 Corinthians twelve nine, is sufficient in our weakness. See, God's power is made strong when we are weak. And so we don't have to do it in our own strength. But when we move in our gifts and our abilities, God's grace uh, brings weight to that. It says in, in his word that God gives grace to the humble. So realize that our gifts come from him. And I used to think, you know, with myself, I would downplay how God had gifted me because I would look at other people and think, wow, they're much better than me. They're smarter than me. You know, like, God, I've, I'm only good at this or that. And I said, like, we don't downplay those things. We don't bury those gifts. And number one, I don't want you to bury that gift, but to develop it. So don't bury it. And what really encouraged me as a Christian was a story of David, who was a shepherd boy, but he uh, eventually became king. And David knew what he was about. It says that he was a talented harp player. In 1 Samuel 16, uh, 15, 22, it says that uh, Saul's servants, they had heard of David. They had heard that he was a talented harp player. It didn't say he was an average one. There was one servant who said, oh, I know this guy because King Saul was uh, troubled by a tormenting spirit and his servant said, we know a guy that can help you with this. He's a talented harp player and it can soothe your spirit while you're listening to this beautiful harp music. And one servant said, I know a guy. His name is David. He is a talented harp player. Also, he's a brave warrior. He had had all these other things. But number one, that was what gave access to the king's palace, his ability to play the harp and play it well. Are you stewarding the gift that God's giving you? Are you giving God your best with what he's given you? And, uh, you know, growing up, people would say, Kathy, you're a good singer. And I would be like, yeah, cool. But I remember a time uh, in my teens where I thought, I'm going to develop this gift. I took lessons. Um, and to tell you the truth, it's actually hard work. It's not easy. And there were a few times where I would be lazy. I wouldn't um, take, you know, music teacher's advice. I think I know it all. And every time I would do that, I would, you know, uh, make mistakes. And I didn't, you know, practice. And I thought to myself, am I steward stewarding this gift well? And when your insecurities get involved when you're developing your gifts, sometimes you can just bury it and think, oh, this is hard work. I can't do this anymore. And I just really sense if you're listening out there and you're thinking, well, it's easy for you to say, Kathy, but I've been discouraged. I remember... Uh, the first time I ever spoke in church, I was at a women's conference, and it was my first time. And I remember being really nervous, and afterwards I would get really positive feedback. And there was this one person 
whose voice really mattered in my life. They were a leader in our church. And she came up to me and I thought, she's going to give me positive feedback. But did she? She said to me, oh, I don't think you should do this. You're terrible. And when she said that, I thought, oh. And then she said, no, 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 that was really bad. And I thought, wow, it was like a knife to the chest, you know. And I thought to myself, I can make a decision here. I can either take that advice on board and go, well, I, you know, I'm not called to do this. I'm not a gifted communicator. Or I could turn it around and say, okay, I'll take your feedback, but I'm not going to stop this because I really believe that God's called me to speak. And so, you know, we can't use excuses like that where people, you know, people will hurt you, disappoint you uh, when you're developing your gifts, but you can't use that as an excuse. You see, in the end, we have to give a personal account before, before God, and he's not going to say, well, that was okay because that person hurt you. No, it's like, how did you steward that gift? We can't use excuses like, well, that person hurt me. It's like God saying to us, look, I've given you this gift. Now steward it well. Negativity will come, of course. You'll have adversity. But it's like, just give it to me. And I had to give it to God. I was so discouraged. But what I found was as as soon as I gave it to God, to God, I began to be more hungry after the word of God. I was like, God, I want to do better. I want to be better with my communication. And so I did that. And I'm so glad I didn't listen to, you know, the voices of negativity. Um, I could have been discouraged, but I carried on. And it's like, don't bury your gift, but develop it. Number two, be you because everyone else is taken. You know, it's easy to be, you know, a copy of someone else because you think that person's better than me. I had this friend who, um, he he was a a young Kiwi boy um, and he was Samoan. And I remember uh, he was sharing on stage, but he was very influenced by American preachers. And when he would speak on stage, he put on an American accent. And I used to say to him when he came off, because he would speak in his normal Kiwi accent off stage, I said, hey, mate, you're not even American. And he said to me, oh, but, you know, they're my influence. And I said, you need to be you, be yourself. I think, you know, like often we're influenced by different people, and that's cool, but I really believe that God anoints who you are. He doesn't anoint who you pretend to be. So be you because everyone else is taken. And what I love about David, who was a shepherd boy, was he knew what he was about. He knew who he was. He knew his identity. And uh, it says in First Samuel, First uh, Samuel, let me look at it. First Samuel seventeen thirty eight to forty. It talks about how uh, King Saul he had this armor that he would use for war. And when David challenged Goliath, King Saul said, look, you know, you're, you're young, you're inexperienced, put on my armor. And so King Saul said to David, I want you to use my armor for battle. But like I said before, David knew what he was about. He knew that, you know, that armor wouldn't help him because he didn't know it. So he put on the armor And he tried to walk in it and tried to move in it. And I think for people out there that try and place unrealistic expectations on you or maybe uh, project their stuff onto you, and you know you can't move in it. When When my husband and I took over the church, people would say to me, you've got big shoes to fill. And I remember panicking and being a little bit fearful, but I remember one person saying to me, Look, I just be yourself. You don't need to be like, uh, you know, that person because they're more spiritual or you think they are. They just said, just be yourself. So I remember when uh, a few people would come up to me and say, "You've got big shoes to fill." I would say to them, "No, I've got. I brought my own shoes because I'm not wearing their shoes. That's their shoes. These are my shoes, and I do things differently because I'm me." And you've got to bring yourself to the table, and that's being honest. I remember asking a Christian psychologist, 
uh, why do people burn out? Because I was really curious. It was one thing that I would wonder, um, what does burnout look like? And he said to me, it's when your inner world does not match your outer world. And he said, when you're, when you're not honest on the inside and that doesn't reflect on the outside, that's where burnout can take place. And I remember when he said that, I thought, okay, so when I, um, I've got to make sure I'm clear and I'm honest with what's inside so I'm not a different person on the outside. And it's also just, you know, setting boundaries. Maybe um, someone's asked you to do something and you know inside you're going, oh, no, I can't, like, but you go, yes. And here's the thing. You've got to be honest on the inside but also honest on the outside. Be you because everyone else is taken. I loved what David's reply was to Saul. He said, look, I can't go in these. I can't go in your armor. And he just picked up his shepherd's staff, what he knew, and he picked up his bag. And it may look on the outside like that's ridiculous, but that's what David knew. And I think sometimes we can neglect the weapons or what God has given us as like, oh, that's just... That's nothing. You know, I'm just a mum. I'm just a teacher. You're not just a mum and you're not just a teacher. Whatever you do, let's not downplay it because God has blessed you in the place that you're in. Or maybe God's given you grace for your place. Number three, keep your eyes on Jesus because he is the author and finisher of our faith. So we don't bury our gift, we develop it. We're ourselves because everyone else is taken. But also we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. What does that mean? Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 talks about this race that has been set before us. And when you're in a race, there are lanes. And hopefully you know how to stay in your lane and you're not getting distracted, or you veer off to the next lane, but you're fixing your attention on the prize, and our prize is Jesus. And sometimes, just sometimes, we can get insecure with uh, where we're at, where we're positioned in the race. Maybe we're, we're not that fast. Maybe there are a few people ahead. There's always going to be someone better than us, someone further than us in the race, and there are people behind us. But here's the thing, you're running your race. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, he is the main thing. And later on in that story, David, the shepherd boy, defeats Goliath. And people are cheering. They're like, wow, David. You know, they start singing his praises. And uh, there are a few scriptures that will come up on the screen. But King Saul... When he first met David, it says, when he instantly saw David, he loved him. So he looked at David and he loved him. But after everyone started cheering for him, it says that Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Now, why, why would I talk about sight? Well, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, when you keep your eyes or when you're looking unto Jesus, He's the author. He's the finisher of our faith. It says King Saul, when he saw David, he loved him. When all this other stuff happened, further maybe David became further down in the race. <laughs> King Saul looked at him with a jealous eye. And the sad thing was that King Saul became enemies with David. Like David didn't see King Saul as an en enemy. He never saw him as an enemy, but King Saul was so jealous. He was like, well, you know, you're popular now. And we've got to be really careful that our insecurities don't cause our eyes to wander. And we've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. What has God called you to? What has he gifted you with? Are you downplaying that gift? Are your insecurities keeping you paralyzed? 
on that race that you're on and you're just thinking, I can't move. I can't move. There are people better than me. There are people behind me. I don't know what to do. Can I just say to you, just keep moving. <laughs> keep mo- moving forward. Keep, keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. I love what Philippians 1, 6 says. It says, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. You know, I, um, my, my name is Kathleen Eleanor Monk. And I just want to share this story with you because I used to hate my name. I used to think, why did you call me that? And my middle name, Eleanor, I was named after my auntie. And uh, uh, our family knew her as a crazy woman. Um, and she used to live with us for a few years. Maybe it was a year. But I knew her longer than that. But she, I only knew her as crazy Aunt Eleanor. And I said to my mum a few weeks ago, why did you name me after her, knowing that she is crazy? And mum said to me, well, I want to tell you her story. And I had never heard it before. And I wish I asked her like years ago. My auntie Eleanor was the first Christian in our family. She gave her heart to the Lord when she was in her early 20s. We come from a really traditional religious family, and my grandparents were ministers of a Samoan traditional church. So my auntie went to this uh, evangelical rally and gave her heart to the Lord, and she never turned back. And she told her parents, who were ministers, I'm going to go to New Zealand. I feel called to New Zealand, and I want to do Faith Bible College. Well, can you imagine the reaction? No, you're not. And she said, yes, I am. So she packed her bags and moved to New Zealand, much to her parents' disapproval. She moved uh, to New Zealand and she did Faith Bible College. She was radically transformed when she did Bible College and came back to Samoa and decided to teach there. Well, she was very influential in that school. She was sharing her faith with the students, with the staff, and she would take some of the students to a um, Bible study and an evangelical rally where these kids were giving their hearts to Jesus. I love that. And I started to look at her with fresh eyes. I thought, she was this crazy lady, and my mum said, no, 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 this is what happened. She really influenced those students' lives Then one of the teachers heard what my auntie was doing and she complained to uh, the school and my family found out. And once my family found out, uh, my uncles were really angry about it. So um, what happened was the school um, disciplined her but they kind of, um, yeah, (laughs) She was beaten for her faith at the school because they said, that's just not on. And ever since that moment, my auntie has never been the same. And I just think to myself, wow, like that's, that's pretty sad. But do you know how she influenced me? She was a really gifted lady. She could play any instrument. And when she was living with us, she would play worship music on the guitar And I remember as an eight-year-old girl, I wasn't a Christian, she would play uh, Christian gospel music in the room. And I remember just a real peace coming into the room every time she played. Even though she was crazy, even though uh, things had turned for the worse, I knew right in her heart and in her spirit She still loved the Lord, and every time she would use her gift, just a peace, a wave of peace would just enter the room. And I remember just being in bed as an eight-year-old girl going, I don't know what this is, but I feel really peaceful. And so my eyes and my my mind changed about my, my middle name. You see, Kathleen means pure, Eleanor means light, Monk means set apart. So my name means pure light set apart. And, you know, I just, 
I used to downplay my name. I used to think, oh, I don't like my name. But now I do. I love my name. And maybe you're listening and you're going, oh, there's nothing really special about me. I just want you to change your mind or the way you think about yourself. There are, no, there are amazing things about you, and maybe you're missing it or you're not looking deep enough. But I just pray that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes to see that you are valued, that you are loved, that God has brought you to this earth for a purpose, that Jesus loves you. And I just want to encourage you. You are gifted. You have many gifts. And God's grace, his weight backs you. I just really sense right now the Holy Spirit is touching people right now. Where you have buried your gift, it's like God is reminding you, take it off the shelf. Start to develop it. It's not too late. It's not too late. Maybe you've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. But that's why we have his grace. His grace brings weight. His grace endorses us to move forward. I just want to pray for you right now. For those that have been discouraged, for those that have uh, been disappointed by different voices, voices from the past or voices that have really just brought weight on you, just heavy weight. Maybe people have projected their stuff onto you, like that armor that Saul placed on David. You just need to take it off. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to pray for you right now, just in this moment. So, Holy Spirit, I just pray for those that are listening, where there has been discouragement, disappointment, and hurt. Lord, we just give it to you right now. And wherever you are, I just want you to just make this movement. Just bring your hand out, and it's symbolizing I'm giving my hurt, my gift to you, my gift to you, and I just pray, Holy Spirit, that your grace would just replace that hurt, that your grace would come and bring weight to those gifts where I have just put them on the shelf. And if you're listening to this, and you've got gifts inside that you haven't developed yet. Make a decision today that you're going to do something about it. Maybe Holy Spirit, just highlight people that you need to talk to to develop those gifts in your life. I just want to encourage you because you never know what that could lead you on to. So make that decision now. So don't bury your gift, develop it. And if you're in here, I mean, if you're out there, sorry, and you're saying to me, you're, you're, you're saying to me, Kathy, be you, but I don't like who I am. It says in Psalm 139 that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I pray that you would get that, get that in your spirit, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And there's no one like you. We need you. We need you. We need you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the author and finisher of your faith. He authors your life and he will finish it. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He's faithful to complete it. And so I pray that this word has encouraged you. Just go out there. Don't hold back. Develop your gifts. Be yourself. We all need we all we need each other. We all need that friend that makes us laugh. We need that friend that cooks really well. We need that friend to organize us. We need each other. We need you. So don't hold back. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Father, I pray for those that have heard this word. Activate. Every person that is listening in Jesus' name, activate those gifts. And I thank you, Lord, that you are speaking to every person listening right now. Illuminate your word. Light it up in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.